Deep Time taught us fact in essentially all the educational institutions of our land and reinforced by the media represents a direct frontal attack on the truthfulness of scripture. On today's program, we'll show that Carbon 14 is now the friend of those who accept the Genesis account as historical. There is overwhelming evidence of only thousands of years, not billions. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Deep Time, Deep Deception, Part 1, with Dr. John Baumgartner. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts, validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. John Baumgartner, is Research Professor Emeritus in the School of Engineering at Liberty University. He has a PhD in geophysics from UCLA and worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory in computational physics during most of his scientific career. Since the early 1980s, he has provided most of the primary research on the concept of catastrophic plate tectonics in connection with Noah's flood. He was also a part of the RATE team, which discovered radioisotope evidence that the Earth is young. Welcome to the program, John. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. We're talking about deep time and deep deception. What does that mean? Well, I'll get into that in, in a moment, but I, I want to start with a rather uh, provocative statement, namely that the concept of deep time has all but destroyed the authority of the Bible in the minds of most educated people today. That is a shocking claim. What do you mean by that? By deep time, I mean the proposition that the earth and most of its rocks and fossils are in fact millions to billions of years old. Uh, and it's essentially equivalent to the belief in the standard geological time scale and the validity of radioisotope dating. I mean, this is just matter of fact in pretty much all the textbooks, high school, college, that this is just what is true. Right. It's the default position. It's in all the t TV documentaries, in all the museums, in all the textbooks. We are, there's hardly any, any uh, challenge to that view today. In fact, if you do question it, you're probably going to be ridiculed or thought of as less than intelligent. Right. It's, there's, there's hardly anyone willing to take a stand against it today. Yeah. So just why is deep time so devastating? To biblical authority. Let's just consider one issue, namely how long have people like us been on the earth? According to the deep time estimates, the answer is at least 200,000 years. So this is when, whether they call it Homo sapiens or whatever it is, modern humans, as it were, first appear. Modern humans that bury their dead, make tools, have complex society, uh, or at least a structured society appear. 200,000 years. Yeah. But according to the Bible, there were only 20 generations of people between Adam and Abraham. And we can count them in the books of Luke and First Chronicles and others. Yes, they're recorded in, in Genesis, the early chapters of Genesis gives them by name. Those names are repeated in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, uh, repeated in the, in, in the New Testament, in Luke's Gospel. The ages of the patriarchs when their sons were born in these genealogies limit the time span between creation, the creation of Adam and the birth of Abraham, to less than some 3,000 years. Uh, by contrast, applying radioisotope dating methods to date human artifacts 
and human remains yields a date of some 200,000 years for the earliest people like us. Using that number and assuming 25 years per generation implies that there were roughly 8,000 generations between the first humans like us and Abraham, according to the deep time uh, picture. So we have a problem then if we're going to understand the Bible is true and try to reconcile what modern science is saying, that, that's not going to work. It doesn't work. Uh, 8,000 human generations before Abraham makes it impossible to interpret the text of Genesis 5 and 11 as real, genuine history. Instead, the text must at best be regarded as allegory or myth. This implies that the individuals named in the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11 must likewise be understood to be allegorical and not real historical people. This includes not only individuals like Enoch and Lamech and Peleg, but also Adam, Eve, and Noah. Now we've got a real problem. Now we, you're starting to see the problem. Mm -hmm. And if Adam and Eve are not real, if they're not real people, that are real historical people, and their temptation and fall as recorded in Genesis 3, that history cannot be true historical history. So our Christian faith, and I'm sure you've heard this, I've heard this, that people, well, all we need is to trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, and, and we really need, don't need to worry about these early chapters in Genesis, and yet the person and work of Jesus depend upon the truth of these early chapters in the Bible. Right. And uh, in addition, because the geological record for the past few thousand years, according to the deep time dating methods, contains no evidence for any global water cataclysm, the flood of Genesis 6 through 8 must also be no more than an allegory if you're using the, the deep time methods to date the rocks. And so, that you can't, so the flood becomes non-history and it's some kind of an allegory. But this is consistent with the deep time logic just mentioned that the individuals in those genealogies, in, including Noah, must be allegorical. So the flood didn't happen, Noah wasn't a real person, Adam wasn't a real person, the Bible's got some neat stories, maybe we can learn some moral lessons from it, right. but it's just not true. Yeah. I, would, I would call what we're dealing with, say, you know, satanic poison. Mm you know, spiritual poison to the soul, it make it, making it very difficult for a Christian today to, to trust the Bible. It reminds me of uh, Genesis chapter 3 when the Satan appears in the form of the serpent and says to Eve, hath God said? That's right. I mean, it's as if he's saying that about the whole Old Testament to us. Did God really say these yeah. things? And science is saying, well, no, he couldn't yeah. have said them. Yeah. So if deep time is real, and Genesis 1 to 11 is not authentic history, then the New Testament simply cannot be God breathed and true. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that that's, there's no other, no other conclusion that you can reach. Jesus refers to Noah, he refers to Sodom and Gomorrah, he refers to Jonah, he refers to Adam, um, he refers to all these people as if they really lived. And, you know, I guess he must have been wrong. Right. So if Noah and the flood isn't true, Jesus' comparison with his sec of his second coming with As Noah in the days of Noah, that's right. Is, means that Jesus didn't know what yeah. he was talking about. The days of Noah were myth. Well, then my second coming is a myth as well. So it, it's devastating, mm. devastating to biblical authority. For me, a person therefore has a, a, a sober choice to make, a Christian. That choice is between either embracing the concept of deep time are embracing Jesus and the truthfulness of the Bible's account of the history of the world. There's no middle ground. There's no compromise position. They, th there are two contradictory cl truth claims and they can't both be true. Therefore, one of them has to be false. Yeah. The widespread acceptance of deep time has decimated biblical Christianity in Europe, mm. especially Western Europe. The churches are empty. Yeah. So why has this deception been such a formidable stronghold and so difficult for those loyal to Jesus to overthrow? 
Why have we not been able to expose this as deep deception? Why, why have we not been able to find the scientific error? That's right. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, and and the, the answer to that is the difficulty of identifying the flaw in radioisotope dating methods. So this is what they use to say the Earth is old. Right. It's the primary means that is used to date rocks and to, to conclude that the Earth is millions and billions of years old. If the Bible's true, then their dating is wrong, which means their dating method has to be mistaken in some way. That's right. So let's go back and look at a little history of radioisotope dating. By 1905, less than 10 years after the discovery of radioactivity by Becquerel and Curie in France, it was realized that the decay of uranium to lead could be used to estimate the age of rocks. From an early determination of the uranium half-life and the measured amounts of lead in some of the first rocks analyzed, uh, it was soon accepted throughout the academic world with a high degree of confidence that the Earth was more than a billion years old. That happened in the first decade of the 20th century. Well, I'm sure this made a lot of secularists very happy. Yes. For secularists in general and atheists in particular, those findings were cause for great jubilation. For them, the radioisotope data established beyond any serious doubt that the earth was billions of years old, that evolution had to be true, and that the Bible was no more than a quaint myth. You know, this is a warning to us as believers too, because they already wanted to believe this. And so as soon as they had something that indicated it, rather than question it, rather than really subject it to critical thinking, they accepted it because it said something they wanted to right, be true. Exactly, exactly. So let's define some terms here. Uh, First, a radioisotope. What is a radioisotope? Well, it's an unstable form of a chemical element that emits various types of radiation uh, as it transforms spontaneously, usually to another, uh, some other element. And the example I'm using here is an atom of polonium-239 that decays by emitting an alpha particle and turns into a uranium-235 atom. Okay, this chemical element is in the rocks. It's in the rocks. Okay. Yeah. We're talking about a spontaneous transformation of a, an atomic species to another atomic species and with the em emission of some radioactive particle. And we can see that, we can examine that it's happened. Yeah, we're going to measure it in the laboratory, measure how fast it happens in the laboratory. Another term that we use is that of half-life. Half-life is the amount of time it takes on average for half of the original radioactive atoms to transform to another type of atom or atoms. This example here, if you start with a thousand radioactive atoms, after one half-life, which I'm assuming here is three days, you'd have only 500 atoms. After another three days, only about 250 atoms, and so on. If it's constant, it would always the half-life would always be the same. Right. So uh, because radioisotope dating represented such a formidable and unanswered challenge to biblical authority, in 1997, uh, the Institute for Creation Research launched an initiative to identify the fundamental error errors in these dating methods. So a, a team was put together involving these, the seven scientists in the first two rows here. Mm. Uh, and I won't name them all, but uh, I, I'm included. And Larry Vardaman with the Institute for Creation Research was the, headed up the, the effort, was the organizer, fundraiser, and coordinator. And we call the group Radioisotopes in the Age of the Earth are the acronym RATE. So the short. RATE team that I mentioned in the intro, this is where that comes from. You were part of this original team. Right. So during the next seven years, we undertook several separate research projects to find the answer to this huge challenge. And God answered our, our plea for His help in several wonderful ways. 
Our team confirmed that C14 is present in all carbon-containing fossils at levels far above, typically 200 to 400 times above the, the uh, detection limit of the instrumentation. So there's no doubt we were, we were observing and others were observing real C14, way above the detection level. According to the usual C14 dating assumptions, the measured C14 levels imply that fossilized organisms are no more than about 50,000 years in age, regardless of where they occur in the rock record. And I'll go into that a bit more. This result is radically at odds with the deep time ages that commonly range from millions to hundreds of million years for fossils. That's absolutely correct, because if you go just from you know, even some of the dinosaurs uh, being, uh, you know, uh, around 100 million years. You, to get to 50,000 is a radical drop, but still we're not within the biblical time frame, yeah, I'll are get we? to that in a moment. So this result, it, it turns out, was already documented in the, in the peer-reviewed C14 literature when we started the project. So they already knew that the levels were not consistent with what That's right. the textbooks were they saying. They already knew that. Uh, so that they, 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 there were organic samples from every part of the fossil record that contained high and consistent levels of C14. This was already in, in scores of, of academic publications. This inconvenient truth had been explained away as what they called in situ contamination. Now what do they mean by that? That means that it, it, the contamination didn't occur in their laboratory. It had somehow got in the sample before it got to their laboratory so in the situ samples, in the ground. All of them weren't saying what they should, so they say, well, the samples are somehow corrupted. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty convenient. Yeah. So here are some, some examples from the standard literature that reported, uh, that in, all, in all cases, given their, their place in the geological record, they ought to have zero C14. The C14 half-life is short. All right, so here we, here we have some of, the, some of the papers and some of the material that was dated using C14. Uh, involves coal, wood, shell, uh, and, and so on. And those numbers on the far left, that's how old that's the, the C14 age, the is That's the C14 saying. age that so was 44, obtained. So 44,900 years, yeah, yeah, 45,200 yeah, years. Yeah. John Baumgartner, who's been sharing about Deep Time, Deep Deception, Part 1. John, just before the break, you mentioned C14 or carbon-14. What is that? It's one type of carbon. All, all the various forms of carbon have six protons in the nucleus, but the different types of uh, different isotopes are called of carbon have different numbers of neutrons. The most carbon is carbon-12. It's got six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus. There's a carbon-13 that has seven neutrons, and carbon-14 has eight neutrons. Uh, carbon-12 and carbon-13 are stable, but carbon-14 is unstable and decays, decays to nitrogen-14 with a half-life of uh, about 5,700 years. Half of it disappears spontaneously. So by measuring the remaining carbon-14 in, in fossils, we can determine how old they are. That's right. All right, John, so your group looked at the carbon-14 uh, in these samples, and what did you find? Okay, aware of the, these results already in the C14 literature, we undertook our own experimental effort to verify them. And, and our approach was to get 10 coal samples 
from the U.S. Department of Energy Coal Repository at Penn State University, and we had these analyzed at one of the best C14 laboratories in the world. And our, our samples were from 10 separate major economic coal deposits across the United States. And here are the results that we obtained. Uh, we have the, uh, uh, the, the name of the coal seam, the state and county where it was located, the ge geological interval, and, and the uh, ages for these samples range from uh, around 40 million years to 315 million years. And, and, and yet the C14 age that was obtained by the laboratory is uh, all of them were in the range of 50,000 years. The, the average was uh, 49,600 C14 years. So the average for all of these uh, samples, and these are some of the best samples, as you said, that you were able to get tested in this laboratory um, going from millions of years for each one all the way down to 40, an average of 49,000. So basically, we simply verified what was already well established in the C14 professional literature. And this would just be written off as what, in situ contamination? Yes, they would say that somehow the C14 got into the samples before it came to the laboratory. Okay. How it happened, they, they have no uh, answer. Okay. Uh, the standard ages for these rocks were from 40 to 315 million years ago. Statistically, however, we saw no difference in the C14 levels from the youngest to the oldest samples. This suggests that the plants that form these separate coal deposits all grew on Earth at the same time and not so long ago. Now, this is referring to the fact that the carbon-14 is found in what would have been living fossils, the plants. Yes. So why did our samples give C14 ages of about 50,000 years when the Bible indicates that the flood took place only some 5,000 years ago? All right, this is the question I've been waiting okay. for you to answer. <laughs> okay, the, the answer is that a standard assumption made in C14 analysis is that the atmospheric C14 level when the organism grew, uh, when it was alive, was close to the same as as the level we measure in the atmosphere today. That's just a, a simple basic assumption. However, for organisms now fossilized deep in the rock record, this assumption is almost certainly not valid. Uh, there are good reasons to suspect that the atmospheric C14 level before the flood was much, much lower than it is today, and that that readily accounts for the difference. So would you say it's fair to say that the secular uh, scientists are, 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 are assuming a starting point that just isn't correct. Yeah, well, they, they, they don't, they're not even thinking that, the, the, uh, uh, that these samples that their other methods give, which give millions of years, could possibly be uh, young. So they, they, C14 is normally used only for dating things that are just a few thousand years uh, old. So they, they, they don't even think about the possibility that C14 could be the true age for, for these coal samples and the bone samples, shells that, that uh, they're measuring. So they have another standard of measurement that says it's much older and that must be right because yeah. that's what they want it to be anyway. That, that's, they've been, they're convinced in the truthfulness of deep time. So in summary, the C14 levels we measure in fossils today powerfully testify that all fossilized organisms live thousands, not tens or hundreds of millions of years ago. They also testify to major inconsistencies among the deep time methods. So uh, in our next program, part two, we'll look at additional rate findings as to why deep time is deep deception, looking at these other radioisotope methods. John, thanks for being with us. Thank you. I thank look you. forward to the next show where we can answer some more of these questions. And I want to thank you for being with us as well. The faith of Christians has been attacked in some ways, perhaps more than ever before in history, with the concept of deep time. Simply put, if the world is more than millions and even billions of years old, 
then the Bible, much of the Bible, can't possibly be true. And many of the things that Jesus Christ said must be mistaken, which means he could not have been God and he cannot save you from your sins. And yet what we saw in looking at the evidence and looking what the rocks actually say, that it's not the scriptures that are at fault, but it's the modern methods and the assumptions used in applying them that truly are incorrect. It just goes to show us once again that we know what the Bible says is true and the proof is all around you. Thanks for joining us. I'd also like to remind you that this program, Origins, takes a lot of people and time and money to put together. We have a great team of folks here, but we need your prayerful and financial support to continue to do programs like this one. If you enjoy Origins, won't you prayerfully consider how you can support us? And we thank you for your help. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this program, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 2001, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.